All right, everyone, good evening. I'm Curtis, I am the uh, director for Startup Grind Singapore. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our fireside chat panel discussion with Monks Hill managing partner and co-founder Peng Tiong. Uh, Peng, how are you doing there? You're in Singapore, uh, just give us all a wave uh, on your camera there, it should pop up. <laughs> so say hi, and uh, we have Oswald Yo. he is the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Glintz, uh, joining us as well in one of uh, Monks Hill's portfolio companies. Uh, just a couple of quick things uh, to mention before we get started with the discussion tonight. Just want to give a quick shout out and thank you to all of the partners and sponsors for Startup Grind, our global sponsor, Amazon Web Services, AWS, as well as our local partners, Grain, Singha, SG Innovate, Chi 1K, Draper Startup House, The Company, and The Great Room. Uh, just to go through some quick housekeeping items, we're going to have about a 30-minute discussion with Oswald and Peng and then we will do q and A. If you've done a startup grind virtual fireside chat, you know that we like to make it interactive just like our in-person events. Uh, so kind of ignore the Q&A uh, chat function in Zoom. Uh, what we will do is when we move into the Q&A sec section of uh, the evening, uh, you can raise your hand virtually. And what I will do is I will unmute you and allow you to ask your question uh, directly to Oswald and Peng. Um, so without further ado, I just wanna get started. Um, just real quickly, do some brief introductions. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Monks Hill Ventures, uh, they are a venture, a VC, Southeast Asia focused VC firm. Uh, they have two funds totaling about $180 million. And then Glintz is a talent platform uh, that has raised about 10 million US dollars to date, including a $6.8 million Series B round in 2019. Um, I think the best place to, to start off is uh, to just allow you guys to just give a little bit more uh, background about your companies and firms. Oswald, I'd like to just start with you. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Glenn's, uh, maybe just kind of give us the brief history of the company and also what your, your kind of core focus is. Uh, I know I mentioned talent platform, but you can probably add a little bit more color to that. Sure, thanks Curtis. Hi everyone, thanks for logging in. Uh, this is also from Glenn's. So we're the number one talent platform in Southeast Asia. So a bit of history about us. We started first in Singapore about five years ago. Um, initially, when we first started the company, the funny back story is my co-founders and I actually haven't gone to college yet. So we went to the US for our universities, thinking we could juggle both our studies and the startup. Uh, that was a terrible idea, because one semester we realized neither our studies or the startup was going anywhere. So we decided to focus on the more important thing, which was the company. So we dropped out from our universities in the US, came back to Southeast Asia um, to focus on the company. When we first started to do that, the papers called us Singaporean parents worst nightmares. So that's a uh, title that we're very proud of when we first started the company. <laughs> and the first few years was very tough because we started first only as an internship portal and we did it only in Singapore. So that was when we first learned one of the first lessons of entrepreneurship, which is the market always wins, right? So that's a very small market. In 2018, we packed out our bags moved to Indonesia, uh, which is a much bigger market, uh, pivoted the model from just internships to full-time jobs and from a classified model to a transaction-based model. And I think with the right market, with the right guidance, we met Ping about the same time then as well. Uh, the growth over the past two years has been tremendous. And right now we are in the process of expanding the region and the end vision is to be the number one talent platform in Southeast Asia. Yeah, back to you, okay. Curtis. Seems you're very well on your way. Uh, Peng, just want to talk to you real quick. Uh, you are a founder and have worked on the other side of the equation as well, being one of the co-founders of a Match or what became Match.com. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you've done uh, with Monks Hill and uh, just kind of the background of the firm and some of the other investments that you guys have made. Yeah, um, I, I never thought I'd be a VC when I was an entrepreneur, and uh, uh, but I spent uh, about four or five years in Beijing with one of the top VC firms there. And I realized, and my Mandarin is not that great. So I realized if I could enjoy being a VC in, in China, I, I could do okay here. And also um, I was working, uh, I was working with Kuai, uh, my, my partner on, uh, on a fund, uh, a government fund. We are running this government fund for the government. Uh, uh, it's the predecessor of SG Innovate, uh, one of your uh, um, sponsors. Um, and 
we, we realized uh, there was not a lot of uh, really uh, depth in, in uh, VC funding in, in Southeast Asia. This was like maybe seven, eight years ago, right? So um, I think both of us almost simultaneously figured out uh, that uh, uh, this region could use a uh, VC fund that's Silicon Valley style, you know, by founders, for founders. Um, and, uh, and so we got on the way. And here we are, five, six years later. Five or six years later, I like to tell people that aren't familiar with the Southeast Asia startup ecosystem that it was really about seven or eight years ago where I noticed in particular things really kicked into high gear on kind of the VC and the funding landscape. Um, Oswald, you know, when we were talking last week, you were mentioning how you kept bothering Peng and he wasn't, you know, kind of, uh, it was like a two-year sales or, um, you know, how that match came about between you guys, uh, you know, you kept reaching out to, to, to Peng and didn't seem like they were very interested at first, or maybe, you know, the interest was muted. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, when you were out there approaching VC firms and fundraising, how you guys came about and what that whole process was until things came to fruition. Hmm. So I think, yeah, it took a lot of tenacity for sure, <laughs> as of all fundraising process. Um, I think we first met Mount Hill in 2016, actually. That was for our previous, previous round of fundraising, which was Series A. Um, but our model was in, our model was still evolving at that time. We didn't, haven't really built the sales engine or found real product market fit, so they didn't invest. But we kept in touch. And I reconnected again with Ping, I think, in 2018 or late 2017. Uh, actually, it wasn't for fundraising. It was... Really, it was we met in Bali. It was a it was a program called Founders Coaching Pause, where Peng was just coaching and guiding some of the founders in the region. Um, so it really was more for just advising and mentorship initially, uh, not for fundraising. But over that process of of I think close to a year, we got to know each other better, and and eventually we started working together through the fundraising process. Yeah. So it was about a two year time frame, uh, and Peng. Um, you know, do you, what was that initial introduction like? Uh, you didn't go in in the initial rounds. It looks like I, I think you came in into a later round. So talk to us a little bit about how that match came about from yeah. your side. Sure. We, we tend to be very clear about how we invest and when we invest, etc. right? So we're not seed investors, so we don't come in uh, the seed round. Uh, when we say A, we don't just mean how much money you're raising. We mean you have certain traction, certain visible indications that your business is real as opposed to you know theoretical um and and so i i always could, i'm very frank with entrepreneurs about that when i look at their business i'll tell them look here's where you are if you're here i think we could potentially invest you know and and i think uh, um the the first time um we connected with um glenn's i i i think uh, i think it was my partner that spent a lot, some time with them and, and obviously, they, they were sort of in the middle of pivoting that model. So that wasn't quite a Series A race. So they were clear on that. We were clear on that. So it wasn't sort of disappointing uh, from that point of view. I don't think it was disappointing from Oswald's point of view. <laughs> um, the entrepreneur's point of view, when they get told, no, or not right now, come talk to us when you have the B, or you're going for a later stage round of funding, uh, you know, that that's not always the words that an entrepreneur wants to hear, but here we are yeah. today and you have made that investment into Glintz. Um, yeah. And you guys work very closely to, uh, with each other. I think, you know, what, what is interesting about this discussion and what a lot of entrepreneurs out there want to know is, you know, once they take that check from a VC firm or from any, uh, uh, anybody that's investing in their company, what are the things that start to happen after that in terms of how, uh, you and Oswald work together uh, to make the company successful. Um, and one of those, you know, I want to talk about is um, getting a board of directors or, or helping build up the right team and the right people. So talk to us a little bit about how quickly those discussions got started after you made that investment and what that was all like. So we'll start with you. Hank. Actually, Oswald is a pretty uh, unique uh, entrepreneur. He was driving most of these issues. How do we put a board together? You know, you so know, he was coming to you with questions on that uh, and taking yeah. the initiative, which is probably something yeah. you wanted to see, which is yeah, good. that's right. You know, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs think of VCs and, and maybe some of 
us don't uh, think of VCs as sort of this bosses that sort of oppress you and, and tell you what to do, etc. And and maybe some of us don't don't behave appropriately. And maybe that's that reputation is deserved. But a, a good functioning set of VCs, a board. It's supposed to help you build a company. It's not supposed to oppress you. It's supposed to help you think about strategy, how to move to the next level, um, and, and maybe double check your, your reasoning and your strategy on, on what you've decided to do, right? I'm very clear, uh, I, and I tell this to the, the, the CEO multiple times when, when I invest in a company, you're the boss, right? I'm supposed to help you the best I can. I can help you network and help you brainstorm. I can help you with a whole bunch of stuff. But ultimately, you're going to have to make the decision. I can be pretty tough in telling you what I think, right? But ultimately, you should be very clear. You're the boss, right? Um, and I, I think uh, it took me a little bit of time not to learn that, but to understand how to behave uh, along those lines. And I, I still struggle because I, I am used to running, you know, in the past, I used to run companies. I don't you know, tell people that this is how you do it, and blah, blah, blah. But these days, um, I, I'm a, a VC, so I'm, I'm not the guy running the thing, right? So, um, I, I think, uh, I think the question is probably best put to Oswald in terms of what you can get as an entrepreneur if you have the right board put together, right? Uh, he, he's gone through a lot of experiences in that domain. Right, Oswald. Let's come to you. Uh, you know, after, you know, that that's. Interesting to hear that once you got the investment, uh, that you were actually the one driving, you know, asking all the questions. Uh, talk to us about how deliberate you were in terms of the VCs that you talked to for that funding, and also, you know, the list of items that you wanted to tackle once you did get that fundraising in. Yeah. So I think one piece of advice that I I hear which I think is a bad piece of advice when it comes to fundraising is some founders and us included when we first started tend to look at a board seat as a negotiating chip in terms of it's actually something that you don't want to give up. Um, you know, if we give you a board seat, then you can give us a better valuation and so on. I think if, but, but if we go from that perspective, then they are actually not the right, if there is not an investor that you want on your board, then they're probably not the right investor to work with in the first place. I think. So the way we looked at it, when we talk about building winning teams, right? I think the first most important team that a company got to build other than the founding team is actually the board. And having the right board, like Ping said, is actually really important. It can help take the business to the next level as well. Um, in our case, I wanted someone, we, ha we have a very young founding team and I wanted someone that we could learn from who has been through that entrepreneurial life cycle. And we thought that Ping would be a great partner to learn from because he has built multiple companies to IPO. So now it can help us to hopefully do the same in this company. Um, and that was how we thought about it, which is to look at investors or partners who had the right mix of experiences or networks that we can then partner with and work with to bring the company to the next level. Yeah. That's great. And, you know, I think it's an interesting point. You talked about making sure that that board seat isn't really a negotiating chip. Um, and that is a really key thing because I think a lot of people realize, you know, that when you're raising funds, it's not just the money that you're after. It's that strategic kind of, uh, you know, input that a VC can provide uh, and making sure that they are the right partner and that they also don't interfere too much with uh, the operations of the company. Like Peng said, he's been a founder, but, you know, it's not, you know, his place to tell you exactly and your team what to do. And, and that does bring up kind of the next question here about disagreements. Um, you know, when we talked last week, you, you were saying uh, we were going through, uh, there was a disagreement kind of you guys had in terms of the strategy uh, in terms of where to take things. And it actually, uh, in hindsight, was the, you know, you guys did choose the right path because of the COVID virus. Um, that kind of cross-border part of your business, Oswald, is really kind of paying off in dividends right now, but what did you, how do you guys work when that disagreement does come up? How do you guys resolve it or, and push forward or, or discuss it? Talk to us about that working dynamic. Who, who would you like yeah. to <laughs> Whoever wants to start. 
<laughs> I I can go. Yeah, I guess it wasn't really a disagreement. It was just um, I think I think the the issue there was we had two lines of business. One was just local recruitment, uh, professional recruitment, and the second line of business was cross border, um, staffing or remote hiring. And I think Ping was particularly interested about the first line of business. Um, he was more interested in that. He did mention to us that the second line of business was something that he was not so excited about. But he didn't tell us to kill it, right? I think he still trusted us to, to run the business as we see fit. Um, and, and we continue to run that. And I think 12 months later, quite luckily because of how the market has evolved as well with COVID, we're seeing a lot of demand for remote hiring, actually more so than just local hiring right now. So I think we're very glad that even though there was not 100% agreement on where to put all of the areas or all the resources in, um, the investor in this case trusted the team to run the business and that led to a good outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend not, uh, I tend to be somewhat opinionated. So you know what I think about whatever it is uh, that's important in the company, right? Uh, and I'm also somewhat clear in fact, the only controls uh, uh, the investor had, even the lead investor, is some of the terms around you know, shareholder uh, uh, agreements where, like, for example, if you want to go public, you know, we get a right to veto it. In fact, positive uh, actions, we almost have nothing. We can, ha we can restrain the company from doing things, but that's about it. And it's only a very small number of things. And by the time we have to exercise some of that, I think we're in terrible, terrible shape. So yeah. the, the, way, <laughs> the way we work with entrepreneurs is to figure out you know, a way to exchange ideas, to exchange thoughts. And so the best ideas uh, come to the fore, right? And if I'm not able to convince the entrepreneur of some idea I have, maybe my ideas are wrong, right? I, I've been known to be wrong, right? So, um, so you know, we, we tend to keep our egos in check. We push hard, you know, we, we have intellectual uh, debates, et cetera, but in the end, we're very clear on who owns the decision, the CEO does. And, and sometimes the CEO delegates that decision to maybe the VP product and he, he or she doesn't even make that decision. It's the VP product that makes that decision. So I think very clear on these roles and responsibilities from the board on down is very important. I've had uh, some entrepreneurs that, you know, not very happy because their boards and them don't have a clear idea on who owns what, right? So the board may be telling them to, telling the, the entrepreneur to do something and he's, he doesn't want to do it and he's not sure what to do about it. So he comes talk to me, you know, things like that. You know, I, I think um, a healthy board, healthy working relationships require very clear lines. Good neighbors, uh, good fences make good neighbors as they say. Yeah. Right. And, you know, that is usually uh, when we, we talk or, you know, whether it's at Startup Grind or, you know, just one-on-one -on -one in private with some entrepreneurs and founders, that's usually where a breakdown starts to happen is the delineated lines of responsibility. You know, what, what's the VC's role in kind of helping the company and what's up to the CEO to own and to do, um, you know, and, and going on that note in terms of talking about how you have helped the company paying uh, when we talked last week uh, enterprise sales was one of the areas that we were talking about and you helped I helped Oswald and his team identify those um, so in terms of just offering strategic advice um, you know how, how should a VC work with an entrepreneur to provide tactical advice and actually rolling their sleeves up and helping the company move forward yeah, um, the, the level at which uh, uh, board members roll their sleeves out is, is not Typically not operational, but if you actually have to roll your sleeves up and, and start, you know, deciding on you know, engineering specs and all that stuff, you're in trouble, right? Um, so it's, it's at the level of strategy uh, or networking. Let me introduce you to three VCs that could do the next round, or let me introduce you, let, let, let's brainstorm on what kind of person you need to hire for this head of uh, enterprise sales role, you know? things like that. Do you need an enterprise sales role head, for example? Um, so, so I think we've had lots of conversations uh, or, or along those lines, you know, what kind of uh, enterprise um, uh, strategy do you want to run? And as a result, what kind of people you need to bring on board? 
Um, in fact, I, 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 you know, it was Oswald who found the candidate. Another investor uh, pointed us to this person, um, and uh, I helped in interview the person. I helped uh, Oswald, you know, give him my two cents on that interview, and also, um, also thinking, helping him think through how to, how to structure the onboarding process and the transition process, etc. So you you can ask him how good or bad it was, but. You know, I just spoke my mind. That's all. I, I didn't even, you know, obviously I didn't say do this, do that. I, I said, here's some ideas, right? Yeah, Oswald, uh, how about, what are your thoughts on that from your perspective? Yeah, I think it goes back to, to the, our point earlier about putting in place a good board that you can learn from. And in this case, we had a board who had done B2B sales before and we are a B2B company. And I think they helped to identify that one potential growth opportunity for us was moving beyond the startup SME sales into enterprise sales. That might have taken us maybe another six or nine months to figure out ourselves, but because we had a good you know, team of board of investors that we could learn from, that accelerated our growth. So I think in this case, it was Ping who identified that there was an era of growth. And then we went off to find the right sort of commercial director or the right head of sales to, to go after this opportunity. Yeah. To, to be fair to my fellow board members, the, uh, Oswald didn't just bring me on the board. I, I was the lead investor in the last round, but there were other folks that stepped up also. And they're, they're also pretty, I, th I think uh, Oswald's strength, he's the chairman of the board in case it wasn't clear, is he actually has put together pretty, one of the most functional boards I've, I've seen in a while, right? So he brought the right people with the right sort of uh, perspectives and, and attitude about board mem being board members, uh, being helpful board members. So yeah. uh, I think that was really useful. And that's an interesting point. Oswald, maybe if you can expand on that, because I think this is one of the areas that startups and entrepreneurs really struggle with is when you're creating a board of directors, it's not just putting five or seven or whatever the number winds up being, depending on where you are on a you know, a board per se, you have to kind of be, it sounds like you really needed to be strategic about it. So maybe can you share with us what your thought process was when you were comprising that board and the people that you were looking for to be on it? Yeah, I think there are two parts to, it's just like putting together any team. Um, you have to look for both culture fit and skills fit. And in the case of putting in place our board, so we have three investor directors. I, I think I was quite conscious in looking for the right culture fit first. And there are a few types of investors, right? There'll be investors who are very focused on maybe just um, hyper growth at all costs, even at negative gross margins. I think Ping likes to call it negative blitz scaling. And maybe there'll be more, there'll be other investors who are more rational and focus more on the business fundamentals. And, in, and to us as a team of founders, we know that we are more in the second camp. So then we want to investors who were in the second camp as well, who will, also work with us to focus on the business fundamentals instead of just focusing on the next up round all the time. So, so, so that, that was sort of one value that I was looking for amongst all of our board of directors, which is can they think for the long term for the business and focus on the right fundamentals together with us rather than just sort of the next fundraise. Um, so that was one thing that we looked for. And that allowed sort of the conversations in all of our boardrooms to come from a common place, which is for the long term and to build a strong business. So it sounds like you did a lot of interviewing for those board member seats. It wasn't the other way around where you had an investor or somebody saying, I want a board seat, just like you alluded to earlier about using it as a negotiating chip. Yeah, not so much interviews, but we, we definitely had a lot of conversations um, about putting in place the right team. Yeah. Right. Some high praise there from Peng in terms of, you know, just how well uh, your board and your team work. Um, I, I want to pivot a little bit and talk to you, Oswald, about the culture of the company, you know, being in that kind of high growth space, you've done a couple rounds of fundraising now, raised some, some serious amounts of money. Um, you know, what's the culture of the company like uh, that you try to create there? Uh, maybe tell us how many people you have on your team right now uh, and what it's been like translating that culture to a remote sort of office environment in the age of coronavirus? Yeah, sure. So for context, we have about 270 full-time staff across five cities right now, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. 
So 270 people across five markets. And I think culture is a thing that brings everyone together. The way we define culture is not just, it's not just whatever you put up on the wall, but we actually break it down to specific behaviors that we expect people to have. So for example, one of our culture values is being relentlessly resourceful. But to us, it's not just a big word that you put up on the, on the wall and post this. We actually break it down into specific behaviors. Like what does it mean to be relentlessly resourceful? And one of it means, you know, to rally optimism, optimism in times of, in difficult times. So, so then we would even measure and evaluate our leaders on how well they are doing, they are performing each of these behaviors during our performance reviews. And that's really how we show that we take uh, culture really seriously. And that's how we bring the company together. Right. And we see one of those posters over your right shoulder there uh, with, uh, I forget, I, I can't see it right now, um, but. <laughs> yeah, this is a random poster. <laughs> this is not in, uh, I think I can read it right there. So. I, I have to tell you something. I, I actually learned something. Uh, I, one of the first board meetings uh, with uh, Oswa, I actually learned something that I've been you know, passing along to other entrepreneurs now. Uh, Basically, uh, the first board meeting was there, you know, the first three slides, the first slide, was vision, mission, values. Those are the first three slides, right? And every board meeting, every meeting we have ever since then, the first three slides are the same three slides. So there's no doubt in your mind when you walk into that room what this company is about, right? And what our values are, what our mission is, et cetera. And, and I, I think... You know, I was thinking, why, why, this is a simple thing. Why, why, why bother doing this? And then I realized, you know, if you go into any random boardroom and you ask board members, so what, what's the vision of the company? Half the time, they, they have to make up stuff, right? Because it's not, <laughs> it's not like really, you know, baked in. And I, I recommend um, it's just a simple thing for you to do if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a CEO. When you start the meeting, you know, go through at least one slide, if not two or three slides, that really very clearly states what you're about. And, and I don't mean like long slides. I mean like, you know, one sentence, right? who you're about. And, and keep reminding people that. I think that, that's really learned something from that. Very true. So it sounds like, Oswald, you run a really tight ship and a really tight board meetings and everything there. So, um, you know, we're going to open up the floor to Q&A. Uh, in a couple of minutes, um, but I just want to talk to both of you just about kind of the general startup ecosystem and what we're dealing with right now uh, with COVID-19, uh, not just in Singapore, but globally. Um, Oswald, what has it been like for your, you and your company in terms of moving the business forward in this age? Has it hindered you? Has it actually been something that was an accelerant that helped propel you to do some things that you were planning on doing and it just came up a few months. Uh, what's that process been like for you guys? Yeah, there have been some ups and downs for sure. Um, but overall it's been, overall it's actually been a net positive for us because we've been quite lucky to be riding on certain trends such as remote hiring. And even for ourselves, I think how remote hiring started was we were initially trying to build our engineering team only in Singapore. Um, but after a while, we realized that was really difficult to do because there weren't enough engineers here and they tend to be quite expensive. We then started to build up a second team of engineers in Taiwan where we realized that, hey, they are like comparable quality, but 50 to 80% of the cost here, right? And I think that, that has given us a tremendous advantage this period where we don't just have one talent supply, but actually we're hiring remotely as well. And this is actually something that a lot of companies can now start to do too. And it's a lot of companies are starting to realize that it really doesn't matter where your people are. Um, you can hire and build a team from anywhere. And you can build a team in Indonesia, you can build a team in Taiwan. And this is something that we're trying to help other companies to do the same as well. Right. Do you have any team members that aren't in the markets that you guys are operating in? Like somebody that you've hired remotely, maybe in Europe to work on something uh, during this time? Yeah, we actually have someone who's in Bali right now. I mean, Indonesia is a key market, <laughs> but she decided to just work from Bali this time around because it really doesn't matter where you are right now. Yeah, more power to her. I think a lot of us wouldn't mind working from Bali during uh, the <laughs> uh, I've seen some yeah. stories on social media of people doing that, and it looks like they're having quite a bit of fun. Uh, Peng, I uh, want to pivot to you. Uh, you I think 
and I, I, I went back and checked, and I think I got this right, but you have the distinct honor of being uh, the first person that we've had uh, who previously spoke at Startup Grind Singapore to come back and speak to us again. And it was about five years ago since your last talk, uh, which was with the previous team. But what have you seen happen in that five years between when you first spoke to us and now in terms of the startup ecosystem in Singapore? Uh, and, and maybe delve into areas like how you've seen founders, uh, the maturity of startups, things like that. Um, you know, the, the way that founders or, or the way that investors are more discerning now. What's kind of transpired in that five years? Let, from your view? Let, let, me, let me come at it from the LP, the investor base first, sure. because that will give you a, actually a really good sense. Um, uh, and then I'll work on the, um, the entrepreneurial side first. Uh, what's happened uh, since um, uh, maybe five, seven years ago, uh, when we were raising our first fund, you know, uh, I, I knew a lot of these um, LPs in the U.S. Uh, who who funded GSR, my previous fund, and um, and basically no one knew what Southeast Asia was, right? I mean, you talk to them, um, you know, they just had no clue and no interest in investing. So we ended up putting together the first fund with mostly local and uh, regional uh, investors, right? People who understood what Southeast Asia is but maybe didn't quite understand venture etc uh, fast forward um, to now and uh, it's uh, i think we're almost southeast asia as a region in terms of venture fund is almost a, a, a reasonably well-defined category already right they know uh, the the recent the analyst company uh, know who the funds are out here you know how much it raised etc and the LPs in, in the US, uh, limited partners uh, running big uh, funds that invest in other funds, they know uh, what their allocation should be or they're thinking through that process now. So we've evolved from something that the global financial um, uh, managers didn't quite understand to one where it's very clear um, that you, you need to be putting your bets into Southeast Asia. So it's it usually takes a lot more time than that. It, but frankly, China, I think, took five, 10 years to get there, right? Uh, I, I think we're, we're there in a shorter amount of time. Uh, and I think that's fantastic. I mean, you know, you, you look at even the public markets, right? Uh, C, C Group, right? One, one of our earlier uh, uh, startups in Southeast Asia. Uh, they are at a valuation, which, you know, is probably, I, I didn't do the math, but it's probably the top, 20, 30 uh, tech companies in terms of valuation already, right? The, the uh, last round I heard was not the uh, I just read something on uh, Bloomberg about them in terms of what the performance of the stock has been like uh, for anyone yeah. who can just go check uh, the performance of their, their stock price over the last year or so. It's been pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's I think more than 10x the IPO price now, right? So. Yeah. So when people, when the financial markets see what's possible from companies in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, and it's not just one company, there's a whole bunch of companies growing very, very fast, right? Um, uh, they, they start to have confidence. And I think thank, thanks of, uh, in part to the sort of US China TIF, right? That there's money also uh, moving out of China, so they need to figure out where to put it. This is becoming the more obvious place to put it also. So I, I think, um, I think uh, we are moving from sort of, you know, unknown investment region to a very well carved out niche in, in the global financial markets, uh, which is really good for us. And I think also um, at the same time, the entrepreneurial ecosystem has developed quite a bit. You, you got all kinds of different groups, VCs helping uh, each other entrepreneurs helping each other. And, and as a result, the maturity of uh, uh, folks in the market has developed. It, it's ways to go. You know, this is like China probably 15 years ago, 10 years ago, but uh, it'll, it'll catch up pretty fast, right? Uh, and, and just to give you a sense, China 15 years, 10 years ago, um, we would find lots of ideas to invest in and we might not find teams to invest in because you know the good teams are so few and far between right um, so 
Uh, but today, China, you can get you know all kinds of really world class entrepreneurs to build companies. Yeah. So. That's a great point that you make about you know great team, great ideas to invest in, and great teams to invest in. Um, quite often, you see a lot of people with great ideas. They don't have the teams there just yet, uh, and that's something that you know Glintz and Oswald can probably help with. But um, now you're really starting to see, and just from my viewpoint, I have started to see great teams and great ideas put together there, which make a really compelling story uh, for the VC space. Um, we're gonna open up the floor to Q&A. There are some Q&As in uh, chat, um, but the way we do it here at Startup Grind, in case you join late, raise your hand virtually. So just, uh, I believe, right click on your name and do the Zoom virtual hand raising. There, we got a, a hand that has gone up. Um, I'm going to unmute you, and then you can actually ask your question directly to Oswald and Peng, uh, have it back and forth. So I'll mute you, leave you unmuted, uh, and allow you to talk uh, until um, you've gotten your question, question answered. Uh, and I will address, uh, there are two anonymous Q&As in uh, the chat function there. Um, so whoever, whoever wrote those down, if you want to ask those live uh, to Peng and Oswald, uh, just put your hands up and I will unmute you, um, but we will get to those uh, regardless if they don't want to uh, ask it on screen. So first question comes from Mary Xiao. Uh, Mary, you are allowed to talk right now. Uh, just uh, I'll unmute you or you can unmute yourself. Yep, Mary, you're on with Peng and Oswald. Thank you for sharing and uh, I'm based in Dubai. I have a question for Oswald and a question for Peng. So the question for Oswald is that, could you share a typical uh, agenda of your board meeting? And the, the, the question for Peng is that, uh, do you actively identify and realize synergies among the startup that you uh, have invested in? Thank you. Sure. Hi, Maria. Thanks for the question. Um, so typical agenda, three main parts. The first part is like things that we re always recap the vision, mission, and broad strategy of the company uh, to make sure that we're all aligned and on the same page. The second part is calibrating on the key metrics. So it's a series of seven to eight graphs, basically, um, of the top level operating metrics of the company, not just the financials, but the operating metrics of the company. Um, so that we're all on the same page about how the company is doing, um, how the growth is. And the third part would then be the strategic discussions, like executive hires that we're making, um, regional expansion markets that we're opening up, et cetera. So there's three parts. Great, and how, how, how frequent you do that? Every month, every quarter, or? We have a board call every six weeks or so, yeah. So okay. twice a quarter. Got it, great, thank you. Oh, okay, so you, you... Uh, you want to uh, want me to comment on synergies? Um, uh, it happens two ways. Uh, we don't actively scan all our portfolio companies and go, oh, okay, we should uh, connect company C with company X. We we don't do that actively. But what happens is when we're on the board, uh, we'll hear things. Oh, company A needs this, and then at a partnership meeting, maybe we'll hear the other guy. Company B needs that, and we can do the connection. And we've done that a lot. Um, uh, when, whenever uh, the entrepreneur, the founder, wants us to connect, we connect also. Right. Uh, so they, they might figure out, okay, uh, I'm I'm doing uh, I, I sell to banks, and maybe I could work with a security provider, which is another portfolio company amongst them to deliver a more thorough solution to the banks. Okay, I, I'll do that introduction and they can pick it up from there. Um, the fact is most of our CEOs know each other. If, if not well, at least uh, they have their, each other's emails, et cetera. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. We have a fairly international crowd. We, uh, I, did, I did want to point out that we did have our friends in Hong Kong, Cebu, Berlin, also promote this event. So we do get a fairly worldwide audience here sometimes. Um, if you got a question, just raise your hand. Uh, I did see one go up, but it looks like they withdrew it. But just want to come to the two questions in the Q&A. Um, oh, there, there is a, a hand that just went up. But 
Uh, well, let me ask the Q&A, and then uh, Mutu Kumar, just uh, sit tight there for one second, and then I'll call on you. Uh, an anonymous attendee wrote this, and I guess this is directed at Oswald. What is your sales setup and revenue model? So we run on a success fee model um, where we charge companies only for every successful hire. So it's not a job board uh, where you, know, you pay $50 and you're not sure if you will get the right applicants. We run purely on a success fee model um, where we have tech and able recruiters that will recommend great talent to our customers, better, faster, cheaper. Yeah. I believe that the so success fee model. Yeah, the, the yep. recruitment uh, industry calls that contingency search, I believe. Some of the older exactly. yep. do it on a contingency basis. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, Mutu Kumar, uh, I am going to unmute you. You are allowed to talk, uh, so you just need to unmute yourself on your end, uh, and you're on with Peng and Oswald. Mutu Kumar, are you there? You're unmuted. We can We can hear you now. You just... You can ask your question. Okay, you might, might, they might be having some technical difficulties. Uh, while we're waiting on that to sort out, uh, let's go to another anonymous attendee. Uh, this happens sometimes where people dump things in anonymously into the Q&A. Um, I guess this is directed at Oswald. You have raised so many rounds of funding since you started. How much equity does the founding team have left? And how do you continue to stay motivated? Um, we have enough of equity, for sure, <laughs> to stay motivated. <laughs> That's a short answer. And then how we stay motivated, I think, you know, finances is, to me, I'm motivated by impact and growth. Um, we have a mission, which is to realize human potential in the region and a vision we're working towards. And we know that every match we're making, we're helping people get great jobs. And that, that is keeping me motivated. And the second part of it is the learning. It feels like every six months I have a new job because I'm learning something new, I'm doing something new. And because of the company's growth, it requires, I think, the founders to be doing something new every six months, um, whether it's learning from our existing board or learning from great executives that we're brought on board. So impact and growth is what drives me, not just equity. Right, and maybe paying uh, just to piggyback off that a little bit in terms of uh, what's the advice that you might give founders in terms of when they're doing fundraising rounds, how to think about founder shares and, and, and just that cap table. Um, yeah. Maybe it's just a top level sort of view, very high yeah. level. Yeah, I mean, we worry about that too. And if through some, for whatever reason, they end up with too few shares, uh, we, we actually have walked away from deals where the founders are like employees, right? So they just don't, don't have enough shares. And, and so, uh, we, and we, we can't figure out how to fix it without getting all the shareholders really upset. So we've walked away from deals like that. Um, um, uh, we, we, in, in cases where you can touch up the founders, we do touch up the founders, you know, uh, and the, the advantage of touching up the founders is the vesting starts from when you come in. So you know, there's still uh, another four years of vesting ahead. Um, we, we, we do think about this a lot. You know, at, at, as, and as I said, below a certain level, uh, the, the founder, uh, founder's ownership might be that of an employee and that gets really uninteresting to us. We could probably spend a half a day talking about cap tables and uh, the advice that VCs and also founders that have gone through and done raises on what's kind of the best sort of splits and cap tables and what they would recommend on that. Um, another discussion for another time, potentially. Uh, I'm going to come back to M Mutu Kumar, um, who has still got his hand raised and will, he can still talk. I think he was having... Uh, some he's difficulties, yeah. Uh, he's got a question in the chat. He's got some technical issues. So, uh, as a VC, uh, how how do attract and how do attract investors? Uh, and I guess what he means by that is attracting investors into the funds that you've raised. Peng, you've got two funds. Uh, one's eighty million. One's a hundred million. Um, how how has that process been? Uh, it, it's not, not trivial. The first one was uh, um, uh, a bit harder because the traditional VC investors 
that there are no traditional VCs in Southeast Asia when we started. So the, the traditional VC investors are not teed up to invest. So you got to go find money where you, you can. The second one got a bit easier because um, uh, the, the world uh, started to realize, hey, there's something going on in Southeast Asia. Right? Uh, uh, and um, I was just talking to my partner uh, uh, on, on this. He's been talking to the institutionals. Um, and I think the third fund is going to be even easier in spite of COVID. Right, that's probably sometime next year, year after. Um, so um, it, it's just sales, you know. Um, and, and being an entrepreneur, I've raised money all my life, so it is not that different. It's actually harder work uh, as a VC because you got in, in a in a startup, you raise money from two, three people, and you're done. Right, the round's done. We got to raise money from like you know twenty, thirty people per fund. Right? Um, so, but we're not complaining. It's just work. Very good insights. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions in Q&A. Uh, anybody that has a question and wants to actually ask it live, um, you know, just put, put your hand up. We have Marco Wu asking who's got a question in Q&A. Marco, just put your hand up if you'd like to ask that live and I, I can unmute you and allow you to, to ask Oswald and ping the question. But um, but I'm just gonna read it out and we can address it right now. Uh, maybe his hand will shoot up in just a bit. Uh, Marco's question is this, will you consider to invest into startups just launched pre, pre customer? So I guess he means pre-revenue by that in this COVID-19 pandemic. And what's your concern for, for the investment happening now during COVID-19? So we, we won't, this is not a COVID issue for us. We're a series A investor, so we don't do seed investments. So uh, the quick answer is uh, we, we just don't do seed investments in general. Um, the, uh, the seed investors though, that I know of are having a, a tougher time because um, the, the, the COVID and uh, downturn is causing the markets to you know, the traditional downturn, everything goes down and it goes back up on the recovery. COVID is different. Some sectors do really well and some sectors are just like, like F&B and hotels and they're just hit really hard, right? So COVID is, is causing opportunities. Um, but the problem is the, the, no one's been through this before and the changes are very kind of dependent on what governments decide to do or how the disease evolves, etc. It, um, so it's really hard for uh, seed investors to figure out what's going to happen, right? Uh, if you manage to sell something to the hospitals today, maybe in three months that's different and they don't need that anymore. So, so it's re really hard to predict. And I think as a result, you, you see some, and, and you, you see some pullback from the seed investors. Um, we noticed a little bit, not a lot of pullback. Right. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of VCs on during this COVID-19 period where we've been doing virtual events and the general consensus seems to be uh, the fundraising gravy train is not slowing down. It, it's really just taking a little bit longer time to do the diligence and everything, uh, you know, to, to get investors comfortable with the firms that they're investing in. So it's, you know, instead of three months of diligence, because you usually can't well back when we were doing some of these discussions you couldn't actually go out and meet people which is such a huge component of doing investments now you know if you're in singapore and you're investing in a singapore based startup you can actually go have a coffee and meet with someone from the sounds of it but um it was just that length of time that it was taking for things to be done um and deal street asia you know they've they've done some research and it's been reported on a, a couple of weeks ago that you know there's plenty of money floating around southeast asia right now uh, ready to be deployed um oswald i want to come to you there is another anonymous question uh and i just saw ashwin's hand go up so uh right as i'm about to read the anonymous attendee questions uh somebody has a has a hand go up so uh we'll get to ashwin in a bit but uh, the question, how do you hyper-local strategize to operate in Southeast Asia? How different is each market? Mm, great question. So hyper-local is really important for us as a strategy um, because we're operating in so many different markets. And I think the first step is it goes back to the team. Um, in order to do a hyper-local strategy, you need a hyper-local team. 
So for example, for our marketing team, uh, we do have a regional head, but we make sure to always have a local marketing team for every new market that we launch in. Uh, in Indonesia, we have a local marketing team. In Vietnam, we have the same or building the same in other markets that we, that we are going into. So for every new market that we go into, we first start with building a local team um, that understands the market the best uh, that goes about the, the content. Um, the second step then is developing hyper-local content. One example is we are doing online courses now in Indonesia and the type of content we have, one of the courses is like, how do you do influencer marketing in Indonesia? There's a lot of courses on Coursera or Udemy about influencer marketing, but I'm confident that this is the only course on the internet that teaches you to do that in a unique context of Indonesia and is given by fellow Indonesia professionals. Yep. So there's an example of how we use a local team to do local marketing. Very good. Uh, we're going to go to Ashwin right now. Ashwin, uh, you can just unmute yourself and you're on with Oswald and Peng. Hi guys, so uh, this is a question tailored towards Mr. Ong. And uh, you mentioned that there weren't as many VCs a couple of years ago and uh, in Southeast Asia. And I was just wondering, what are some of the emerging sectors that we can expect to see that have been unique or underrepresented in Southeast Asia currently that VCs are becoming attracted to? What's like driving money towards this uh, new region? Yeah. Um... So, so the big picture um, uh, is that uh, at this stage of economic development at uh, about 4,000 GDP per capita is when um, the services industry, which is about half the economy uh, at this stage of economic development, so it's about $1.5 trillion of GDP is in services and if you look at services being delivered in Southeast Asia, from, from logistics to retail to you know what have you, um, uh, it, uh, you you'll notice very inefficient systems. And uh, and what tech companies do is they come in with technology and they don't just give you a five ten percent kind of improvement improvement in productivity. It they think in terms of two x three x four x the productivity of that particular sector. And if you are three, four times the effectiveness of your competitor, you end up winning. And we've seen this happen across uh, all the different sectors in China, like five, 10 years ago, right? China has a $5.5 trillion services industry, right? And that, if you look at the leaders of all the, the different sectors in that industry, they are, uh, in, that, uh, in the service uh, verticals, they're all tech companies most of them right and and so this this and these are not older companies that figured out how to you know use technology these are new companies that got built up with different models with different uh, uh, IT systems and and they go win the market um, so so when the the reason I'm taking a bit to answer the question is because um, there is no one vertical that we look at it and we go, okay, this, this is it, right? Uh, there, there are some verticals that are more interesting. I think education is getting more interesting today because we're learning something from COVID. Healthcare is the other area. Um, but then, you know, there was uh, transportation, there was retail, there was, so, so there lots of different sectors. And, and that's just the services stuff. And that, there's also um, a little bit of a view on building tech companies that they are not going after the, the uh, service verticals, but supplying technology, uh, but custom for uh, emerging markets needs. But th that's a much smaller uh, uh, market. I don't know if that answers the question, Ashwin. Yeah, yeah, that does. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for the question, Ashwin. Um, we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, there's been a couple that have come in on the, the Q&A chat. Uh, Oswald, uh, I'm going to direct these towards you. Um, how should a small startup decide whether they need external funding? We'll start with Oswald, and I guess also, Peng, you can chime in on this if you want, but how should a small startup decide whether they need external funding? And I guess, Oswald, you can speak from the perspective as a founder who was a small startup at one point. Yeah, well, I, I think it goes back again to the people for me. There are two parts here. One is 
um, I think no matter the stage, if it's an investor that you feel like you can learn from and partner with, then I think you should always take the money. Even if you haven't reached product market fit, but the investor decides to fund you, I think that's a great thing. But, and on the flip side, even if you have reached maturity, but it is not the right investor that you think you can work with, no matter the amount of money that the investor is offering you, I think you shouldn't take it. So I think that goes back to the people. Um, the second side of it is, I think what Pink calls the repeatable sales model, right? Uh, once your business founds a repeatable sort of product market fit, repeatable way to generate profitable revenue, I think that's a great time to raise funding. Getting anything to add about advice to small startups as to when's the right time to go out there to, to or make that decision as to when you should take some external money? Yeah, well, one of the, the big questions uh, you, you should ask yourself if you're thinking of fundraising is, um, are you a VC fundable um, business, right? Most businesses on the planet are not VC fundable. And, and it's not, uh, this is not a negative statement I'm making. It's nothing to do with whether it's a good company or not. It's, if your total addressable market is below a certain size, most VCs won't fund it. It's very simple. That's a returns model that the VCs are building upon when they raise money to invest. And, uh, and one of the assumptions is certain sizes of uh, addressable markets by the companies they invest in. So, so you, you got to figure that out. It's unfortunate, but a lot of times I still get um, uh, questions from entrepreneurs. You know, I've spent time with people and, and one of the things I have to make clear to them is, look, it's not necessarily a bad thing is if, if you choose, number one, choose not to raise money because you don't need to, you can make money. You can, you can raise money from your customers, which is more important than from investors. And then secondly, uh, you might be in a market which is too small for VCs to come into. So you need to get really clear on those things before you spend time trying to raise money. And uh, very strong agreement with, um, with uh, Oswald. If you don't think that's a match with you and the VC, don't take their money. Some very good advice. You know, some people would say uh, that, you know, if someone's about to hand you a check, that's great. But um, I think, you know, there's been startups and entrepreneurs that have taken money that they, they wish that they hadn't take, uh, taken anywhere in this world, or, you know, for that matter. I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but um, that is some very, very good advice, Peng. Um, what were the, this is another question, and we're going to just answer it and then I got one more for Oswald after this and then we'll wrap up but what were the primary reasons for Monks Hill's investment into Glintz? Hmm. Okay. Um, re relatively straightforward there's always two pieces the main piece is the team right very disciplined execution right um, when I when I caught up with them at FCP they were sort of brainstorming me how to reimagine the business right and then a year and a half later, you know, they had executed quite significantly into that reimagination, right? Um, and, um, and, uh, and so I had confidence that they could, you know, given the way they think and trans uh, transform the thoughts to the strategies to execution, right, repeatedly. And uh, I, I had some level of confidence that some of the struggles in the past was due to, um, due to strategy as opposed to execution. So, so I got lots of confidence and, and it's paid out, right? A very disciplined team. The numbers are always there. When you talk to them, you know where the, what the state of the company is, et cetera. There's not a lot of, can you please make sure your, your um, balance sheet is correct, right? There's not a lot of conversations like that. You know, it's just, here's the numbers. Let's think about the strategy. So really great team, right? Um, uh, really thoughtful, uh, really open to feedback, you know, uh, non-defensive, right? Uh, so that's the people side of things. Uh, that, that's, I, I like to say that's all our founders, but not, not necessarily, you know. Um, uh, and then the other side is uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we, uh, this uh, tech companies are going to take over a lot of services, um, businesses, and we think one of them is uh, a very significant one is uh, recruitment, HR, right? Uh, I've been looking for a good company to invest in for, I don't know, three, four years now, right? Uh, the challenge was I couldn't find a, a team that was executing to a strategy I believed in. Right? 
and um, and uh, along came Osmo. So there we go. And they also wanted my money, so it makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> final uh, final questions here, um, and this is for Oswald, uh, and these are a little personal, uh, so answer how you wish. Uh, what's the end game for Glintz acquisition IPO, and what's Glintz's annual revenue? <laughs> <laughs> On the first question, well, the, the, goal is, the goal is to IPO the company, but that's not the end game. I think IPO is just a funding mechanism, right? I think that's a goal for us, but that's not the end game. The end game is to be a really huge company with lots of impact. Um, I've heard a great analogy about how IPO is just a, it's just a process where you are like getting to the big leagues and then, then there's more people that you are sort of playing with. So that's something we look forward to, but that's not the end game. We want to keep playing the game. Yeah. Annual revenue is not something that we really discuss publicly. <laughs> so I'll pass on that for now. I don't blame you for not answering the last one uh, and yeah. deferring there. Uh, but the, um, I, I think that's an excellent point that you made, Oswald, is that you know, people tend to equate exits or equity events like that or liquidity events uh, as the end game. And, and really, it's not the end game like you, you, you mentioned. It is just something, it's a funding mechanism. It's a fundraising event, basically. Uh, the end game, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's not when someone IPOs a company that, you know, the, the founding team just kind of says, see you guys later and, and exit stage right. Yeah. It's, it's not. Uh, it just is a milestone in the company's history. And it's really up to them to, to, to continue and to keep going. And, you know, we've even in the age of COVID, uh, if anybody's watched the news, there's been some pretty uh, serious uh filings uh, or hints that IPOs of some big tech names in the United States out of Silicon Valley are on the way. Um, so, so yeah, I think I'd like to la leave it there. Uh, Peng uh, and Oswald, thank you so much for coming to Startup Grind uh, to share your thoughts and insights. Uh, Oswald, I believe also you have some thought leadership and some white papers on uh, some ways that, you know, startups and people that are hiring right now can hire remotely and, and do that remotely. So for those that are on the call right now, we will, I think, uh, find a way to get that out to, to, to people, yep. um, give some thought leadership on that. And uh, I just want to thank you both for coming. Peng, thank you for coming back. Uh, we'd love to have you a third time as well. Uh, you know, somewhere in the future, maybe not another five years down the road, but a little bit sooner. But uh, I hope you guys all stay safe. And thank you everyone for coming to Startup Grind tonight. Take care, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks, King. Thanks, everyone.